This is the Stark Truth, hosted by Robert Stark. Brought to you by StarkTruthRadio.com. Robert Stark is an American journalist and political commentator. You can listen to his podcast at www.StarkTruthRadio.com. This is uh, Robert uh, Stark. I'm joined here with uh, Matthew uh, Pegan and David Cole. We're going Hello. to be discussing an upcoming uh, film project that we have about about the life's work of Mel Gibson's uh, father, Hutton Gibson. Uh, great having you guys on the show. Great to be here, as always. Likewise. To explain the project is all three of us, we're going to be uh, co-directors but the basis of the documentary is on footage that David Cole collected with uh, Hutton Gibson. And there, ha- I mean, there has been co- past controversies, which we'll get into, about Hutton, which were brought in. They were brought up by the media in the past, uh, around the time that the Passion came out. But to start things off, David, do you want to uh, introduce... Uh, I mean, how far back do you go with Hutton? How you got in touch with him and... The story behind the interview. Well, first, uh, just to give some perspective to the audience, Hutton Gibson, who was Mel Gibson's father, passed away on May 11th, uh, just three months short of his 102nd birthday. So the man almost lived to 102, which is great. Um, I interviewed him in 2004, and I'll give you briefly the context of that. Um, the the passion, the passion of the Christ, uh, was just about to open worldwide, <clears throat> and uh, of course it was a huge story all over the media. Um, media outlets, quite a few of them, were looking for reasons to attack Mel Gibson. Uh, there were rumors, there were whispers that the passion was anti-Semitic or that it portrayed Jews in a bad light. Now, at the time, it was very hard to go back to 2004 with knowing what people know now about Mel Gibson and some of the troubles he went through after that. The footage with Hutton, was this before the controversial incidents, uh, including the drunk driving arrests and what happened later? 2000, early 2004, March of 2004, when The Passion came out, nothing had happened yet. There had not been any scandal. So what I was saying is that uh, as it's very difficult to cast your mind back to March 2004 when we didn't uh, know any of the stuff that would come out about the scandals. Now, there had always been an understanding in Hollywood that Mel was a religious man, that Mel was Catholic to an extent, but a lot of people could never quite put their finger on it because they knew that Mel uh, had a church that uh, was kind of uh, almost a family church, the Gibson family church that his father had founded. Uh, but there was a lot of confusion. Is it a Catholic church? Is it a, a, a separate sect? Uh, is it a heretical sect of Catholicism? Is it a Seda de Contest uh, sect of Catholicism? So there wasn't a lot known. All that was really known by the media at the time was that Mel was a very religious guy and he took his faith very seriously and his father was the spiritual the religious leader of the family uh, Mel has many brothers and sisters many uh, kids many nieces many nephews it's a very big family it's a family that believes very strongly in going forth and multiplying so this is when we go back to March 2004 no drunk driving arrest yet No problems with his girlfriend yet. Uh, None of that. And so the press was trying to find 
something. The press was trying to find something to give some controversy. And they zeroed in on Mel's father, Hutton. And uh, they found some statements he had made in a radio call-in show. Uh, Just his voice. He had never been on camera giving an interview or anything. But they found some statements he made that seemed controversial about the Holocaust, about Jews. And and that became a very big thing. Groups like the ADL played that up. This was with uh, Hutton before the controversies with Mel. But what were the exact the exact quotes from Hutton? Where did they come from, and when were those? When did they become an issue with the, with the public? Well, Hutton had called into several talk shows, radio talk shows over the years, including the Alex Jones show back when Alex Jones had a radio show prior to his internet uh, career, and um, there again there there was uh, there was a certain amount of confusion about what Hutton Gibson believed because it, it's not like he called these radio shows and gave any kind of manifesto. He seems to ex- ex- express a certain amount of skepticism about certain Holocaust claims. Uh, and he uh, it was rumored that his views on the Catholic faith uh, that he believed that the Vatican II Council was itself heretical and that everything in the church since Vatican II uh, w- is, was not of the true faith and was therefore false and shouldn't be followed. Uh, but uh, to get to try to put one in the mindset of March 2004, this was all scattered information. That's an important thing to remember. Again, we got to go back to a time before social media and when people didn't have websites. And there was not even a YouTube yet. YouTube didn't even exist yet in 2004, mm-hmm. let alone Facebook uh, or Twitter or any of these, these other things. So people were hearing scattered things that were going through a kind of media telephone machine where the ADL would say something, the New York Times would say another thing. Oh, so this uh, was brought up in 2004 when The Passion was released? Or was this an issue even further? Did the media cover Hutton like prior to that even? Uh, no, as I was saying, in March 2004, the media was looking for something, some type of controversy to hang around the project to hang around the neck of the passion. <clears throat> there had never been much of an issue before because Mel, prior to the passion, not only had Mel lived a fully scandal-free existence in Hollywood, but his movies were always mainstream, enjoyable, big-budget films. <clears throat> he was the very definition of the A-list superstar and he did popular entertainment he was a very well-liked guy if you remember when he did when he played himself on an episode of the simpsons the running gag was that everybody liked him that that nobody could ever speak ill of him or even criticize one of his movies that was mel's persona in the years before the passion but even the thing is with uh, the incident with the drunk driving that happened after the passion but there was this kind of in-between period when The Passion came out. So he was, uh, yeah, I mean, by the general public, I'd say he was still relatively well-liked. But there were issues being brought up by the media about uh, about The Passion and about about theology and concerns that there were anti-Semitic tropes. Yes, because uh, since The Passion was essentially a passion play... Uh, the the story of the death <clears throat> of Jesus, um, there were concerns that Jewish groups like the ADL had, that the Jews were going to be portrayed negatively, uh, that, that Mel might blame the death of Jesus on the Jews and not sufficiently blame the Romans. Uh, all this kind of stuff. Keep in mind, remember, people were grasping for things. No one had seen the movie yet. And, and to so, clarify, uh, at this time, when the passion was coming out, people knew that Mel Gibson was Catholic, and they might have known that his father was Catholic, but they but they weren't necessarily aware that they were actually uh, an offshoot of Catholicism that they'd started their own sect. Or was that somewhat known? Well, it was very vague to the public. 
I mean, a lot of people that there there certainly there were people who knew what the Gibson Church was all about and their their state of Kantism, their belief in um, the difference between the mainstream Catholic Church. So, state of Kantism, just to kind of explain, is that all traditional Catholics who reject uh, Vatican II, or that's a even more specific niche? Well, I get in trouble every time I get to all encompassing. I will always hear from various Catholic, uh, either uh, congregants or theologians, and they'll always say, "No, no, there's this schism and that schism." So I'm, I'm just I, it, so as to not offend anyone. There are many schisms. There's not just one state of a contest belief. Now, state of a contest means that the papal see is vacant. The, the chair is vacant. There is no pope. It's the belief that after Pope Pius, starting with Pope John and the Vatican II, <clears throat> Vatican II conference, that the Catholic Church ceased to be representative of the Word of God, became an institution of man, and therefore is not to be followed. But there's not just one sect of Catholics who believe this. And they go That's that there right. are some there are some who just call themselves traditionalists, some who specifically call themselves State of Acontists. There are other terms as well. The Gibson Family Church is a specific entity uh, among <clears throat> other there are other uh, Catholics who hold similar beliefs but also don't consider themselves a member of this one, and that one doesn't consider itself the member of, of the other one. Uh, and so whenever I, I, whenever people hear me talk about this or, or write about it, um, they, they always get very concerned that I'm going to lump everything together. So I'm not lumping everything. Uh, there are certain groups like Gibson's Church, which are, they're basically explicitly separate from the Catholic Church. They consider themselves the real Catholic Church, but they, they're not in any kind of communion with the general body of the Catholic Church, and they would admit to that. Whereas there's other groups which are, say, to a contest or, or simply anti-Vatican II that actually, you know, have not fully broken away from the Church. Uh, one example being, uh, this, I think it's called the Society of Pope Pius X. So I guess th there's, not only are there different groups, but those different groups have a completely different relationship with the broader Catholic Church with some of them considering themselves still to be a part of it and others being more explicitly separatist. A hundred percent true, Matt. That That is a hundred percent true. Uh, that, And it's important to stress that on that spectrum of different groups, different uh, interpretations, that Gibson, Hutton Gibson and his views, and therefore Mel Gibson and the whole Gibson family and their views, they are completely anti the mainstream Catholic Church. They're not they're they're not looking for reconciliation. They don't want to see themselves or be seen as an offshoot uh, or yet or maybe a poor relation of the mainstream Catholic Church. They are separate and they they are very much against what they see as what the mainstream Catholic Church has become. It's worth noting, especially since there's so many people in our circles who would maybe identify as quote unquote trad cats that that's actually a different thing. A lot of trad cats, you know, still go to mass. They still go to, to Catholic churches. They just have extremely traditionalist views, whereas Gibson's church is an explicit traditionalist uh, splinter of the Catholic right. church. Right, right, exactly, and that's a very important thing. And, of course, that's one of the things that Hutton himself talks about. So let me segue a little bit more then uh, to get to the interview. With the interview with Hutton, uh, David, can you explain more about your, your personal backstory with Hutton Gibson, and how did that interview uh, come into fruition? How did you set that up? Of course. Uh, so again, we go back to March 2004. Um, Hutton and I traveled in the same circles. He's his. Uh, he had a very strong interest in Holocaust revisionism, and of course, my history. Pretty much everything I did in the 1990s was centered and built around. Holocaust revisionism. I was known as the only Jewish guy in Holocaust revisionism, and I, generally I was the one always uh, involved in whatever media we got back then, 60 Minutes, 48 Hours, all the different daytime talk shows that I did. So Hutton knew my work, and we were in touch. Uh, as I said, we knew the same people, 
and we had each other's information. Um, and I was the first one to reach out to him at that time, March 2004. I reached out to him, though. My message to him, I wasn't thinking yet at that moment of, of an interview. <clears throat> I sent him, uh, he didn't have email. We just wrote letters, very old fashioned. Uh, he always wrote letters. So I wrote him a letter because I felt it was very distasteful the way the media was using him to attack his son, to attack Mel. Uh, people had done that to me during my revisionism days. They would uh, try to use my parents to attack me. They, they would try to go through family to either get family to denounce me or to create some kind of tension within my family. It's a very underhanded, very dirty tactic that certain groups like the ADL used to do. So I reached out to Hutton basically to say, I sympathize with what you and Mel are going through. I've been there. And it's regardless of one's beliefs, and certainly I'm not a Catholic, um, uh, any type of, of Catholic, so this wasn't somebody, this wasn't one Catholic right or another, it was me, David, David Cole, the secular Jew, uh, writing to Hutton Gibson, and, um, <clears throat> but I just let him know that, that I felt for him, felt for what he was going through, and it basically it was just a, a letter of, of solidarity. And that began a correspondence over the course of several weeks, because, of course, since we were writing actual letters, it would take several days for one letter to get to one person and them to write a letter, get it back. So we're talking about a couple weeks go by. And uh, Hutton wanted to do an interview. It, it was more than an interview. Interview is kind of uh, putting it a little too blithely. Um, Hutton wanted to record a record of his uh, beliefs, his feelings, his thoughts on, on everything, on, on Catholicism, on theology in general, on the Holocaust, on other faiths. He had been accused of being anti-Jewish. He had been accused of being anti-Muslim. How well do you think that he addressed that with you? Uh, you don't personally find him anti-Semitic because his views on salvation excludes everyone outside the church, but... How did he explain those his positions against the allegations against him? And also, like, did he really did want to make like his case to the public and to better explain his positions as opposed to how the media was describing him? Yeah, and also just to continue, though, to set the scene, it was decided that I would come out to Tomball, Texas, which is right outside Houston, and that I would bring a cameraman and equipment and that I would set up two-camera shoot uh, at Hutton's very nice home that he had in this suburb in a gated community. Uh, the big fountain in the middle was very, very pretty. And I made the decision. It was kind of, uh, it was the kind of thing I used to do back then. I decided to drive there with my director, with the guy who'd be directing the shoot. Um, it, it, I probably should have flown, but I liked, I always like road trips and I just feel freer when I can uh, pull over at a motel or a hotel and uh, have dinner whenever I want to. So I made the decision to drive all the way from L.A. to Houston. Uh, it took several days, of course, and um, but it was two of us, so I'm just me, and a, a, an SUV full of equipment. Uh, and then we rendezvoused with a person in Houston who helped us out additionally as, as a crewman. Uh, so... Once we get there, and I've got a whole weekend with Hutton. It wasn't just one day, but I was going to be there the whole weekend. Um, it's important to, to stress for your, your listeners that this was a passive interview. I wasn't there to prompt or argue or create controversy. This was for Hutton to say the things he wanted to say. And, and I would be functioning solely as the eyes and ears of the audience and really only interject at those times if I felt that, that maybe there was something left unsaid, that maybe I, as an audience member, had a question 
I, that where I'd, I'd like a little more info about something. But I wasn't there to debate, and I wasn't there to pass judgment. So when we talk about, do I feel he's anti-Semitic? Do I feel, is he a Holocaust revisionist? Is he a Holocaust denier? Is he just a curious historical buff? I, I'm very uh, concerned with just letting his words speak for themselves and letting everybody draw their own conclusion because none, none, of, none of this is about what David Cole thinks. It's, it's not about my opinion of the man. I liked him. I mean, we got along very well. He could not have been more hospitable to me. Um, there were several Gibson family members, one of Mel's brothers and that brother's family and, and, and one of the sisters. They were all living in that same area. So, so I didn't were just... there any concerns from their part about whether your interview would be fair towards him and then overall like were they were they satisfied by the results of the interview like did Hutton did Hutton say like David you were a fair interviewer and this is the positions I want up there well, it's a good question and one of the things that was very clear during that weekend seeing Hutton interact with his his two of his other children and all of his grandchildren uh, it became really clear what a patriarchal family this was. Hutton was uh, at the top of the pyramid. No one, no one questioned his decisions. In other words, there, wa there, were, there were no concerns expressed because it was taken for granted that if Hutton wants to do something, he's doing it for a reason, and he has a good reason to do it, and his decisions are all made smartly and... Uh, for the right reasons. So when I would meet the other family members, they were fine with it. They figured if Hutton's fine with it, they are fine with it. In fact, my memories of the dinners that we had, the two nights that I was there, the dinners I had with the big family, we really just talked about everyday life things, art, movies, entertainment. You know, when, when the cameras weren't rolling, it was just like a gathering of happy people. Uh, I didn't drink very much back then, so I, I wasn't. Uh, I don't think there was any alcohol. Well, I'm put it this way: if there was alcohol, I don't remember seeing it. I certainly didn't partake of any. Um, five years later, I would have demanded lots of booze. So the interview happened for me just, just at the right time before my alcoholism started to get very much out of control. Uh, so it was just a very friendly, happy time with very contented, very happy people. But there was, there was certainly no questioning of Hutton's uh, desires. Uh, he wanted to do this lengthy interview, these interview sessions, and the family was very accepting of it. They were accepting of me. They were accepting of, of my cameraman. Uh, and uh, we had a wonderful time. So uh, that was, a, it was interesting seeing that family dynamic uh, of, I mean, it was really great. It was, actually, was the when, footage when, exclusively of Hutton or did the family allow you to film the other, the rest of the family? No, this was just of Hutton. He just wanted this to be his testament, uh, his words, basically uh, for posterity, all of his views. Uh, we were we did the interview sessions pretty much all during the day. I think that his uh, the the Mel siblings out there were probably at work during that period, so it wasn't even really a matter of, of them being around. I only saw them in the evening. Uh, but this was Mel Mel's dad. This was Hutton's show, and uh, nobody else asked to take part of it. Hutton did recommend that when I got back to L.A. He recommended that I look up another of Mel's brothers, Donald, uh, Donald Gibson, who lived in L.A. at the time. And Mel, of course, lives out here, Malibu, Agoura Hills. Um, Donald lived out here as well, and Donald is the brother who does, he sounds very much like Mel, so Donald does a lot of voiceover work for, for the direct-to-video 
sequels to some of the Disney films that Mel has voiced. So uh, Donald was – Hutton wanted to see if Donald wanted to be in the film in some way because Donald is in the entertainment industry. But uh, we could never work it out. I spoke to Donald a couple times when I got back to L.A., and uh, we never really got together to do anything. Now, it, important to stress for your listeners, one stipulation – of these interview sessions was that nothing was to be released until Hutton passed away. Basically what you said earlier is that Hutton wanted to present his views to the media. Did he give any explicit reasons why he wanted it to be the film footage to be put off until he passed away? Well, not to the media. He wanted a testament of his views for posterity. Uh, oh, so it was not so much. Every- it wasn't about the media coverage, about like controversies. It was more to record his legacy in the long term. So there's a record of his life. Well, yes, I'm just saying he wasn't recording it for the media. I'm sure that one of the reasons he wanted to do it was because of the media coverage. But he wasn't recording this for the media. He was recording it for the public. He was recording it so that there would be a collected uh, record of his views. Now, as far as why he didn't want it released until after he passed away, there were several stages to that decision. The first stage was while I was there and doing the interviews, Hutton definitely did not want this released while the passion was out, while the movie, the passion, was in theaters. Now, that's obvious why that was, because it would have been a distraction. The passion was Mel's um, great magnum opus, his most personal project that he'd ever done, And Hutton did not want to take away from that at all by having this interview out there, having this footage out there, because he knew the media would jump all over it. Uh, Because there are a lot of controversial things that are said in the course of the interview. To go over the controversies in the film is there's the whole background with revisionism, and then that's probably the most controversial, but then another thing... Plenty of other things. Yeah, also, uh, would you say the yeah, view but, but, of the church on their salvation? Because I saw that article in Newsweek about, yeah. about evangelicals and the passion. Yeah, with evangelical Christians and their view about salvation only through their specific church. Right. I, I wanted to. I don't want to keep the audience hanging. I want to finish the, the point that I was making about the stages the, uh, of how the decision was made to not have the footage released until Hutton dies. The first phase was he definitely did not want it released while the passion was in theaters. And then uh, I'd say about a year later, I'm back in L.A., um, I get a call from him, and at that point he and I spoke about the fact that he had decided he didn't want it released, period, until he died. Um, and we didn't have that in writing or anything. I mean, the release forms I had from him gave me the ability to release it whenever, but it was a matter of respect for him. He did not want it released while he was alive, and I agreed. Um, Now, at the time, he was still in his 80s. There was no way of knowing that he was going to live to be 102, Uh, but I agreed with him uh, that uh, I would not release anything until he passed away. Um, And also keep in mind then, after that point, we start getting into Mel's controversies, Mel's personal issues, the drunk driving, the the problems with the young lady in his life. And during that period, I spoke to Hutton a couple times during that period, and it was very, very clear Hutton did not want this coming out. Did you stay in touch with Hutton over a regular basis, or did he touch get in touch with you much later to express those specific concerns about releasing it? Well, I mean, the, this stuff all happened within the course of a decade. I mean, uh, I, I shoot the thing in 2004. Um, 2005 is when I first hear from him uh, again by phone saying, wait a, wait a bit to release this, wait till I die. And then I hear from him again over the course of the next three or four years while Mel is going through some of these uh, these personal issues. And it, it was basically, he would call me to confirm that I wasn't planning to release anything. I mean, I, it would it would have been very easy 
to take advantage of the media climate during that period and release clips of this interview to TMZ or to any of the tabloids or TV shows. But Hutton didn't want that done, and I respected that. Uh, the last time I spoke to him was probably around 2014. Um, and I, I have not spo I did not speak to him in the six years before he passed. I don't even know what his mental state was like in, in those last. Do, were you in touch with anyone else from from Mel Gibson's family besides Hutton in that time frame? No, not at that time. Uh, initially, after the interview, I stayed in touch with several of the cousins, uh, Mel's cousins, who I made friends with during the, the my time in Houston. But uh, since 2014, I had, there was no contact with uh, with Hutton anymore. No contact with his uh, family. Um, and as far as I knew, Hutton was going to live to be 110. I mean, there there was really no there was no way to know just how long he was going to keep going. And it was wonderful. I mean, God bless him. 102, that is that is a great long life and certainly a very full life. Uh, but now that he has passed, um, as per his wishes to have this released, uh, that's what we're doing. That And uh, now to go back to the thing that you were talking about uh, a couple minutes ago, there are a lot of controversial points throughout this uh, entire interview. Obviously, the Holocaust, we talk about that quite a bit. Uh, we talk about Judaism. We talk about Islam. Some of the more interesting stuff, and of course, there's a lot of theology, a lot of stuff about the Catholic uh, Church and Hutton's own faith. Uh, some of the most controversial stuff, in my opinion, is some of the stuff about marriage and children and family life. Uh, and also um, the Gibson family. Hutton was very proud of his family. There's a lot of whole segments devoted to uh, Gibson uh, having a family. Hutton Gibson has, starting his family, Mel being born, how Mel was raised. Uh, how Mel basically took over the church as the kind of lead leader of it as Hutton started to get older. Uh, so a lot of stuff about the Gibson family. That, that's why it would have been easy, you know, very, very cheap, and I wouldn't have done it, but it would have been very easy to release clips of this during some of Mel's more troubled period. Um, but again, that's not what I wanted to do. More importantly, that's not what Hutton wanted to do. I don't mean this as any kind of smearing question, but to what extent do you think some of some of the structure of the church and some of his behavior was in any way cult-like? Well, now we get into the go back to the thing about me being a passive interviewer. That's one of those questions that really is up to everybody individually to uh, answer. There's mm -hmm. a famous quote, I believe. Gosh, I'm tempted to say it was Ambrose Bierce. But um, I, I can't be 100%. But it, basically it is um, – the, de the definition of a cult is the other guy's religion. Yeah. Uh, and there are obviously people who are going to hear some of what Hutton has to say. And they're going to say, oh my gosh, that is a cult. That is a compound. They live in a compound. They live in this insulated environment where they only speak Latin during the mass, and it's completely impenetrable to the outside world, and they have their own language about it. That's gonna, there are going to be people who say that, but of course there are people who say that about Mormonism. There are people who yeah. say that about, about most things. Even, uh, even mainstream Catholicism, people will right. critique it on that level. I mean you bring up an interesting right. point. Uh, we we tend to be very critical of very of of hierarchy when it's on a small scale like that, and you know you talk about him being the patriarch and such. Uh, we, we're very critical of that on a small scale, but then again, how many institutions in society are organizing? Mel Gibson, like he was never explicitly political, like some Hollywood Republican types who've David. David's obviously known a lot of them, but he was very religious and socially conservative, so that automatically creates a tension with a lot of Hollywood, which is very liberal, socially liberal at least. So they're going to be opposed to that from a liberal standpoint. And then there was that thing I sent you from Newsweek about what evangelicals might think about the views, their views on salvation, because 
Mill ha- does have a lot of fans among evangelicals. Yeah, and uh, it is important to point out that next year, I think it's scheduled for around Easter next year, the sequel to The Passion is coming out that's going to deal with the resurrection, and that is where, as you pointed out, Robert, with that article in, in Newsweek, that's where Catholics and evangelicals have certain disagreements about what happened in between the crucifixion and uh, the resurrection. So um, all of these the, all of these matters, uh, in a way, this Hutton Gibson interview is a Rorschach test. People are going to bring their own prejudices and their own biases and their own history to it. Uh, and again, that is why what we're putting together as we put this uh, this interview together, these interview sessions, we put them together in, in, in a film format, we're doing the opposite of what someone like Michael Moore, like a hack like that would do. Michael Moore is all about telling the audience what to believe, telling the audience what to think. These are my opinions, and I'm going to make them your opinions. I'm going to I'm going to squeeze the information and mold it and shape it until it fits my mold. Um, we're not doing that. We're doing the exact opposite. Our objective with this project is to be as, as unbiased as possible, to be fair and respectful to the Gibson family and Hutton's legacy. But the thing is, there are these different concerns from different sides of the audience. So, so you tweeted, you made this announcement on Twitter, and you got some retweet by some different... I think it was like that guy Greer. He's sort of a light who has Scott a big Greer. following. Scott yeah. Greer, yeah, he retweeted it, and a lot of the the commentators. David's following is fairly is fairly conservative, and a lot of them were emphasizing that it is important to be respectful to Mel and to Hutton's legacy and to the Gibson family. But then the other angle, I think we should just be honest about it and explicit about this is for this documentary to be successful, it does need coverage from the mainstream media. There are people in the mainstream media who might who might see this as an opportunity to say, oh yeah, like he really is uh, what we, we said all this time. So I think it is it is really crucial to be to be neutral, to have different perspectives, to interview to interview different like I, one thing I'd like to do is interview people in Hollywood who have worked with Mel as well as there are, there actually are people from Hollywood backgrounds who are fairly liberal, but they've still defended Mel against how he was treated. I mean, a lot of people would say it did seem like at a period there was a period where he was just flat out uh, blacklisted, but he has had success at his own independent projects because he's wealthy enough to fund them. And he's, t- I mean, Mel Gibson is a talented filmmaker, so it is important finding that right balance as being respectful, but at the same time. Creating something that will grab the media's attention. Yeah, and the key to that is remaining neutral. The key to that is simply letting Hutton Gibson have his say as he wanted to have. Uh, and um, there's you can't control or channel how other people are going to interpret what he says. He knew this. Hutton was sharp as a tack when I interviewed him in 2004. And he understood that people are going to interpret his words as they as they choose to, as they want to. He's a very personable guy, um, uh, very friendly. Uh, he was not in any way, even when he talks about people he doesn't like or things he doesn't like, he's very personable about it. And he understood he's going to put these words out there for the world and people are going to interpret them as they will. The media will uh, make of this as they wish and there's no way to control that the only thing that we can do as filmmakers is to have integrity about it and uh, give give the late hutton gibson the respect of letting him have his say Uh, as um uh as we've talked about before there have been there's like one horribly negative piece on a hollywood oh uh, yeah yeah you have that link it's Mm -hmm. going to be linked on the indiegogo site but yeah, that is yeah. really pretty pretty rude I mean, about him. I mean, even if you disagree with someone uh, politically, it's a pretty rude thing to say about someone who passed away. Yeah, you have this uh, this entertainment site, Showbiz 411, and this guy, uh, Friedman, who used to write for uh, Fox News and The Washington Post. And 
Friedman basically he, he's well not basically he he literally says roast in hell Hutton Gibson hell's too good for you and my God this man yeah. has just died he was a father a grandfather and a great grandfather and just because you don't like something he might have said about the Holocaust you're going to wish him to hell uh, the day after he dies it, it's it's horrific and goes beyond disrespectful but that's why it's important for hutton to have the last word people will say what they want about him they they have and they always will but this will be his testament his views he had a whole weekend to tell me anything that he wanted to tell me uh i was there a captive audience for him with all of the uh video in the world to to record so uh, this is for him, he knew that when he died, his critics would have a field day. But uh, this, is, this is him having his say. Before I wrap up the show, uh, David, do you want to plug the Indiegogo site that you set up for fundraising? Basically, like, make your pitch to people who hear this in the audience, to the media. Make your pitch to both, uh, both your fans and also your pitch to more the mainstream media who's would have interest in this as well and also if you want to comment on some of the production aspects well of course keep in mind for your your listeners the production is all three of us and and the uh, indiegogo page um i tried to just give the the all of the details and the basics that somebody would need to know to understand what the project is all about um I think it conveys the essence of the project. I think it conveys why the project is interesting. And <clears throat> certainly it's going to be a thought-provoking, the kind of thought-provoking documentary that's going to get people talking for a very, very long time because the issues that are touched upon are evergreen issues, issues of faith and family, issues of religion, politics, stuff that um, a history, of course, things that are not dependent on who is president at the moment or uh, who is in control of Congress at the moment or whatever else might be going on in the country at this particular moment. These are eternal issues that are being discussed, and that's why I think this documentary would have legs for many, many, many years to come. You were talking about concerns about concerns from conservatives and from his fans and family concerns that there might that might portray controversies are there some, are there a lot of things in the film that will portray him in a positive light and will bring bring more positive attention as well which i think is important well i mean that that's a tough question because everybody's going to view it with their own biases i can talk about my own bias but i knew the guy i liked him so regardless of even the uh content of what he says I like the guy he's a feisty man he was a fighter he was an author a playwright a theologian a well-read man but he was also very funny uh, he told some great anecdotes in the film there are some very light moments as well as the heavy stuff so from a personal point of view <clears throat> I think people w are, are going to like him whether they agree with what he says, disagree with what he says, love half of it, hate half of it, that's going to be up to every individual viewer who sees it. I can't speak for everyone, but I can certainly say that um, he's riveting. And uh, any any fan of the documentary genre knows it's the most important thing. If somebody is riveting and they can keep your attention for a couple of hours, that's really what matters. You may love them, you may hate them, but if you're compelled to watch them, then it's by that standard alone, it's a good documentary. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> as David has kind of said, my goal in assisting with the film will be to make a, a product that anyone watching, regardless of the biases they might bring in from all sides, can appreciate kind of sociologically and make their own decisions about what they see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for this documentary to be successful, obviously all three of us are co-directors on this, and it's not just going to be one long interview with Hutton. That will be the focal point, but what we'd like to do on the production angle 
is get lots of footage and conduct interviews with lots of different people, people in the entertainment industry, people who have personal connections. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically right. what we're going for in the production angle. That actually should be part of our pitch that we make here and maybe even on the crowdfunding or on social media is that uh, if anyone knows someone or if anyone is someone who might have, um, who feels they might have important insight uh, into Hutton Gibson or any of the matters here, uh, where we are still looking for people to potentially interview or take contributions from. Yes, absolutely. We, we've already got a couple of supplemental interviews under the belt. We're looking for some other ones, and we do want to open it up, obviously, so it's not just a couple of hours of, of looking at one man talking. The, by opening it up, by getting additional perspectives uh, of people who knew him, people who either were members of the church or family, friends, or colleagues, or people who are in the business, people or people who are in theology. Uh, but it's bringing in additional perspectives um, to open the film up a bit and make it a real documentary and, and not just one long interview. Uh, now, the entire raw footage from the interview will be released when we do a DVD. That will be one of the special features where you'll get to see everything because we want to make it clear that we're not selectively editing anything from what Hutton is, is saying. But we also have to make a film that has a certain runtime, uh, of course, and we want to make a film that is kind of a complete movie, a documentary, not just an interview, but an actual documentary film. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, and it's an interesting project. And Hutton Gibson is someone who, I mean, he, he lived a really remarkable life, and... I mean, I look forward to putting this out to the public. I mean, this really could very well become a work of art. Yeah. Well, people will talk about this for years, and people will be very excited when they see it. And it'll, be, it'll get people talking, and that's the most important thing, and I think that's what Hutton would have wanted. People will begin discussing the things that he discusses, whether pro or con, but people will be talking. Yeah, and the important thing is that you've given the man a chance to, uh, you know, uh, sum up his life and views in his own words, and that's kind of what we're combating. Combating here is uh, actors in the media who would, uh, you know, try to define his legacy on their own without actually going to the first-hand source. Yeah, exactly. This is his. It's his legacy, like you said. This is his legacy, and he wanted it to live on after him. So we're honoring that request. But I did want to say that part of my interest in the subject is that I actually did grow up. Pretty, and I was alluding to this earlier. I grew up in, from a pretty conservative Catholic background, though nothing like uh, Hutton Gibson's church, but nevertheless conservative Catholic. And I, um, I remember when The Passion came out, and that, what a big deal that was to a lot of the kind of families in my family's circle. Um, but one thing that's interesting for me to think about and to kind of explore as we look at the footage and stuff is how you know how how. How in line is a lot of what Hutton was saying with um, um, just the the difference between the Catholic Church and Hutton Gibson's church? One angle of my interest is that I did uh, grow up in a fairly conservative Catholic background. Not as conservative as Hutton Gibson's church, but nevertheless fairly conservative. And I remember what a big deal it was to a lot to my family and a lot of families in the kind of Catholic circle in which I grew up when The Passion came out. But one thing that I don't think was as understood at that time that I'm interested in is the kind of the tension between uh, a more traditional Catholic conservatism and the explicitly fringe ideas of Hutton Gibson and how that plays out. Well, um, I think it is important to remind people what an incredible global success the passion was. Uh, the film made about a billion dollars worldwide. Lots of families of, of, Catholics, not and not Catholics who subscribe to everything that Hutton Gibson says, um, or even subscribe to part of it. But it w the Passion was such an important film for so many people, and it's very interesting in Hutton Gibson to see the the theology that Mel grew up in and that Mel still adheres to, and the, that's the theology that propelled Mel to make the passion. Everything that Mel is in terms of his beliefs and how he expresses them comes from his dad, 
comes from his dad's faith and the church that the dad created and built. So for all of the people globally who saw and loved the passion, um, whatever your individual faith may be, uh, or what a type of Catholic or what type of Christian you might uh, consider yourself, but everybody who saw the passion loved it. Uh, this film will give you the best insight ever about why Mel believes what he believes, what he believes, and uh, how he lived that growing up and how he lives it to this day. Uh, we're at the end of the show. I would like to thank uh, David Cole for being on. It's been an excellent show. Always a pleasure, Robert. Anytime you know that. Anytime I'm always here to do your show because it is my favorite show to do, uh, and I've done a lot of them, and they've, they've all had their good points, uh, but yours is my favorite, so it's always a pleasure. And also, thanks, Matt. Of course. Nice to talk to you guys.